lives uh, during uh, the project and uh, it's always a, an opportunity just to get a little bit of an insight into the heart of people uh, because in, in projects like this I've seen over a number of years that God really does a work in the life of people um, and that's what we wanted we I communicated to the group when we were there that my goal is one of the great goals we have when we're in these places is that you see God in a clearer light that God would become more real to you and, uh, and that it would inspire in your life uh, a greater commitment to him and a, a greater love for him and, and things like that. And uh, I appreciate it. We, we took time during uh, every day pretty much to take testimonies along the way while we were over there. And uh, it, it was very insightful uh, to see God working in lives, and we're grateful for that. And tonight... We're just going to have, um, we had uh, five people, including myself, that go, went over, and each of them are going to speak. Uh, I'll let the first, I'll let everyone else speak first, and then I'll come at the end and say a few things myself that I'd like to share uh, in regards to Paris and really Project World itself, the ministry. And I'm thankful for what God is doing with it, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to some greater things in the future. So what I'm going to do... I'm going to pick on the people that are closest to the front to start. Let's see, who is that? Oh, Steph! Oh, oh what do you know? <laughs> Come on up. And then how would we go ahead with Bob? And then... And then um, Jake. Jake. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> and then Frank, if you want to round it up with, the, with you folks, okay? Why don't you come up, Steph? me I could go last so I'm gonna hold this against him but just wanted to thank the church um, for praying collectively and the 10 individuals for praying as well too I can sometimes have a really bad attitude so felt like I did really well on the trip I could tell that people were specifically praying about um, me and my attitude so thank you for that um, <laughs> Everybody came home alive and whole, so it was, it was good, it was good. Um, I, I would say there, there were two reoccurring themes and like sets of verses that just kept coming back into my heart throughout the trip. Um, the first one is from 1 John 2, 8 through 11. Again, a new commandment I read unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness has passed and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. And I think the first reoccurring theme that just kept coming is really the love, the love of the brethren, the love of our church family. Um, I think being in large groups of people for in like an intimate setting for an extended period of time can present both unique challenges and blessings. Um, and you know, sometimes our personalities and our aptitudes can clash, um, but some, some of the best blessings can come through shared learning. So I wanted to thank Bob for, um, for showing me to trust God. I think circumstances happened, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but things happened to Bob on the trip that I would have just sobbed and called my parents panicking and I look over at Bob and Bob is like being super reflective and just like God's trying to teach me to trust him I just need to start learning to trust him and I, I know in my heart that's not the attitude I would have and I was just really humbled by that and Frank I was just again humbled I think by your your honesty and your earnest um, heart to just do and be where God wants you to be and regardless of the circumstances and the, and the pain I know you were experiencing, just pushing through because that's what you felt God was calling you to do. And Pastor, I strive to be a Christian that believes that God will do great and mighty things, but you're a Christian that actually lives that life, and you write visions and plans, and you, you do them, um, knowing that God will do great and mighty things. And I thank you for that encouragement. And Jake, I think you probably hauled a piece of all of our luggage across London, including my pillow. <laughs> and I just, I just think you have such a servant's heart um, and a willingness to help others. And I, I just was really, again, humbled by your willingness just to see a need and silently um, help out. 
without recognition. And I hope others learn from me that I'm growing and um, I still need a lot of grace. Um, then the, the second set of verses or theme that, that I that kind of kept coming back in and I saw in devotions and even hymns that we sing, which is, I mean, I did pick the hymn, so it's kind of, you know, suggestive, but uh, was <laughs> First Peter 4, 1 through 2. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. And there were a couple devotions, and Pastor did a, a pretty um, clear one on our Christian walk is a spiritual warfare. There was some physical suffering. I have a few blisters. <laughs> there were so many stairs. My thighs will never be the same. Um, and I mean, eating chocolate croissants and pizza was really hard, but I did it for Jesus. Um, <laughs> but the really the battle for me was mentally. I had some really discouraging days. Like people would come home after a day of outreach and they're like, I got a thousand tracks out or I got eight bundles of tracks out. <laughs> One day people got a box of tracks out and had to come take some of mine where I had three days in a row that I couldn't get out 50 tracks. And it was so discouraging to like stand in the heat, in my blisters, for five hours and just get rejected, track after track after track. And, and then like to come home and like people had really successful days. I'm like, ah, what's wrong with me? <laughs> but I had to remind myself that though verbally the Parisians were saying no mercy, no mercy, which is no thank you, if you look at their life, you look at their apathy, you look at their substance use, their self-harm, um, I saw a lot of cutting, um, their body mutilization, and just their mockery for the beliefs of others, their spiritual person is dead and really crying out for mercy, even though with their mouths they're saying, um, no thank you. And I had to remind myself that my job is to stand up for Jesus my job is to be faithful in what God has called me and to really trust him with the results. So, all right, that was it. Thank you so much. It's tough to follow an angel like that, but I will do my best. One thing that I learned on this trip is how to be humble and understand that God owns everything. Because a personal property of mine was taken from me and I could have fallen apart, but I realized the Lord is doing this for a reason. He's teaching me humility. He's letting me know that everything that I have belongs to him. And that is only through his grace that he's letting me use it while I'm here on earth. I can sympathize with what Steph was saying, Paris. There are times where you're handing out tracks faster than you can deal. And other times you feel like the loneliest person on a busy street. There's nobody interested in your stuff. And it's amazing what people will do particularly mothers with children. I've got to demonstrate this. <laughs> so I'm standing here, right? I'm not moving towards them. The, the mother will grab the child, like, turn away, turn away. And it makes you feel like you are some sort of pariah, that you've got leprosy or something. And uh, it's just an interesting way that people deal with this. But it is our job to go forth, and God willing, I continue to plan to do that. Thank you. Under two minutes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I know I, uh, you know, wasn't too long ago before I last addressed the outfit. But I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, you know, uh, I would like to thank you all for praying for our group while we were away. It's much appreciated. They were felt, 
and uh, uh, pastor asked us, you know, to talk about, you know, what God did in our lives while we were over there. And uh, what he showed me is that he has a purpose for my life. He has a purpose for me. And, you know, while there's breath in my body, he's got a pers- uh, purpose for me. And I didn't get saved until like a few years ago. It's 2024 now. I got saved about the summer of 2020. And, you know, before that, you know, I came out of the world. I was living for the world, living for myself, you know, like everybody does. And, you know, the world's push is, you know, you know, travel, you know, go find yourself, go traveling and have an adventure and all that, you know. And, you know, I, I did some of that, you know. I'd been to Paris before, traveled to other countries in Europe before. You know, I've been to Asia. Uh, I've been to a handful of national parks. The count's somewhere in 12 now. And, you know, I did that, you know, here, there, everywhere, checking things out. And, you know, as a result of that, I had like a little travel fatigue. You know, uh, you know, you just go someplace, see some city, they got a museum, you check it out, you have the local food, yeah, you know. And, you know, you go, you go on a hiking trail on some national park and it looks all exotic on the uh, Facebook pictures, so you go and see it and you see the animal, you do the hike, you take the picture, and it's just like, you know, I got, I got kind of bored with it. And, you know, <laughs> you know, and like I just kind of lost steam with that. And so I became one of those guys that had like excessive PTO, you know, you, you just rack up all the PTO at the end of the year, and then like December, the HR person's coming around saying, hey, Jake, you know, use it or lose it, you know, take a day off. And, you know, so I was one of those guys, just all this time, what am I doing with it? But, you know, now that I'm saved, all that's different. You know, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, I have a new purpose in life, you know, and, um, and I'm looking forward to it, you know. You know, I'm in a church, I'm plugged in, I'm serving the Lord, and it's great. I love it. And, you know, it's exciting to see that, you know, God has a plan for my PTO. You know, God has a t- plan for, you know, the, the money in my bank account. And I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, I'm looking forward to serving. And, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what he has in store for me. So, you know, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah. So that's what God showed me. And, uh, you know, I'm just very happy that I found Metropolitan Baptist Church. And I thank God that, you know, we got a, you know, pastor that can take us by the hand and help us fulfill the Great Commission. And thank you for all of you guys. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's kind of funny. I get here back to the church and everybody tells me or asks me, so what was it like to fly in first class? <laughs> well, that came at a price. And I did, that's one reason why I know God is here. God is with us. God protects us. Um, I tried to run to catch my second flight, and as I'm reaching the gate, it's closing. I wasn't very happy. Didn't even think about God, you know, whatever. Uh, I even fell. And they picked me up, put me in a wheelchair, and we're going to take care of you. But that's my plane. You gotta, and the plane didn't leave for another 10, 15 minutes. Why couldn't they just open the door and let me in? I don't know. Again, I said I wasn't very happy. So I said a prayer, and uh, they said we can get you out at the 9 o'clock pl- flight, which is two hours after my team left me. <laughs> That's actually how I felt at first, but it wasn't them. I mean, the pastor had a responsibility, you know. But if he was like the shepherd, where he let the 99 there and went for the... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> but anyway, the attendant came over to me and gave me a new boarding pass. And I go, well, that's, that's probably better than what I had. <laughs> Ten minutes later, she came over, took that one, 
and gave me another one. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Isn't eight in first class? You deserve it. Boy, that was nice. <laughs> the funny thing about the whole thing is when I got to the airport, they were still waiting because they put their luggage on my plane. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Cheered me up a little bit. <laughs> That's number one. I have three points, and I'll be quick. The second one is, and Pastor doesn't know about this one because I don't think we got together again and gave testimonies. But I'm on the train coming back from, uh, it's a long train. So it took a while to get from point A to point B. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting in, the, in one of the seats here. There was a teenage girl sitting here, her father sitting here, and a 12-year-old boy sitting there. And the Lord's telling me, talk to him. No, I'm done. No, talk to him. So I pulled out a French track, because I knew they were French. And I said, can I give this to you? And he spoke a little bit of English, and he said, yes. And I gave it to him, and he opened it right away and started reading it. His daughter got curious, walked behind, walked behind him, and was reading it with him. And I says, would you like one? I gave her one. She sat down and was reading it. The 10-year-old boy looked at me, and I looked at him, so you want one? And he took it, or 12-year-old boy. And I think the rapport started because I gave each of the kids a piece of candy, American candy. They didn't even either have either one of them. And they all finished reading it by the time they left the train. They left before I did. And the father stood up and says, Frank, that's what we needed. We're having problems in our family, and I needed that. And I'm going to go on that QR code, and I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to listen or ask questions if I can get the questions answered. And the boy just gave me the biggest smile ever, and the daughter, she didn't say anything to me, so that was fine. So they got off the, the train, and I'm thinking, now I know why you did this. Um, the third thing that I want to talk about is friendship. First of all, I wouldn't have made it without God helping. You know how many stairs there were over there? <laughs> Every time I'd walk up the stairs, Bob would go, 74, <laughs> 32, and God took care of me. And you know what it was for? It was because of your prayers. Uh, and like Jake said, we could feel them. We really could. And Stephanie... <laughs> What a woman. She, she, she was something else over there. She would walk behind me to make sure I wasn't the last one. She uplifted me so many times, and all of a sudden, one time we're walking, and she came up and ran up to me and says, stay with me, go across the road. And here it was a guy that was, that, I, don't, I didn't even see him. But I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate the way you handled me as far as accepted that I couldn't walk as fast as everybody else. And then there's Jake. Boy, there was Jake. <laughs> you would never know that he was a new Christian. You never would. I didn't agree with some things he said or did or whatever, and I kind of clammed up and whatnot. But this man's a leader. He's a testifier, he's a witness, he was very impressionable in my life while we were over there. He didn't know that because I didn't tell him. But Jake, I thank you for your friendship, and I ask your forgiveness for being the way I was with you. And then there's Bob. Bob was my best friend over there. He was my partner every single day. Did you know that man can run? <laughs> Even bicyclers. But the sweetest smile he had when he laid down a track for a younger kid or whatnot. And, you know, it doesn't matter to me, or I don't think it matters to God, that you handed out eight packs of tracks, five tracks or whatever. Bob and I did the job, we think, 
that God asks us to do. That's important. Bob, I love you, I love you all, but Bob, I hear my friend over there. When he got his wallet stolen, God told me, help him out. So I gave him some money. Didn't think about it. Some other person, I'm not sure who it was, gave you some money. Not thinking about it. Went out to eat. No, Bob, I'll take care of it. He's my buddy. He's my track buddy. That's what I'm going to call him from now on. <laughs> and pastor, we wouldn't have been able to be that way with each other if it wasn't for our pastor. I can't say enough about him. There was one point in time he had to straighten me out and tell me that he loved me. You know how much that meant? That meant a lot. Thank you all for your prayers. <laughs> oh, I was going to show that one picture of you, but never mind. No. <laughs> no. Thank you, guys. The, those were very meaningful. And um, I'm, I'm grateful. This was, a, the, this was a interesting endeavor. I mean, we've done projects before, but it was... It was a different set of situations. I guess I'd like to take the rest of the time tonight just to share my testimony a little bit and, and so forth. But um, it came at birth. I, we, we've done uh, projects in the past for some of the lower level international competitions, the Youth Olympics, the Pan Am Games, the Asian Games, and so forth. And they were more region specific or continent specific. But the but the Olympics themselves, I, I've never really wanted to pursue them because, well, I always knew that there were other groups there and uh, that were involved in, in evangelism and so forth. And I was just like, there, there's, there's enough there. The, the smaller ones, they don't get a whole lot of attention. It really uh, opens up the opportunities for us in a greater way. But for whatever reason, about a year ago, just a little, I think it would have been probably about July of last year, I was praying, and I, like I, I mentioned to some folks, I may have mentioned it here, but I got a, a map of my wall in my uh, office at home of Europe, and of course I got that before COVID because we had originally had plans of doing projects in Europe, and COVID just completely blew that apart. And uh, anyways, I was praying about it, and I don't know, it just was impressed upon my heart. You know, maybe you should try... To do something for the Olympics, and I'm like, into myself, I, it's only a year away. We got Thailand coming up. Well, how am I going to get people to go there? You know, all these different things. And I, and what I usually do when I get an idea that seems a little harebrained, I I talk to my wife and I say, what do you, <laughs> what do you, what do you think of this? And to be honest with you, she's like, yeah, maybe you should try. I'm like, really? <laughs> oh boy, um, you sure about this? The problem was I didn't know anybody in Paris. I have not seen many, if any, missionaries ever go to France. Now there are missionaries there, don't get me wrong, but I've never known any personally. And I've known a, a fair amount of missionaries in my lifetime now, but not never really there. And so I started digging on the Internet, and, and I found somebody I thought could be a potential partner, and I called them and reached out to them, and we talked, and... They were interested and in all this kind of stuff. Well, I, I scheduled the trip to go there to meet them, to kind of lay the groundwork for everything. And uh, September of last year, I got there and, and uh, I had a meeting with, with their leadership and it didn't go well at all. And uh, it, particularly with one of them who was more of an evangelical than I thought. And that was problematic because of some of the things that they practiced. Let's just put it this way. He offered me wine when I came to their house. Okay, no. You know, so, something was wrong there. And I remember that night just being <laughs> distraught about that. Here I, I came all this way, and it's just like, this is insane. They said they'd get back to me three weeks or so, and I already knew it was going to be a no-go, but they finally gave me the official no and, and told me, basically, we, we have just too many differences, and we did. And so it was like, boy, well, here I'm back to square one. <laughs> Maybe I should be done, but uh, I don't know. I just kept feeling impressed. Well, don't stop. And I learned of another Parisian pastor over there that, that um, 
seemed to be conservative enough, and I, I called him. He, he spoke good English, and he said, well, no, I'm already working with somebody. But and then he gave me a name of a couple other pastors. He said, well, this guy, you know, he speaks English. <laughs> and uh, he's in a southern suburb here, and I had saw his name from other missionaries that I had, um, had um, reached out to in the region and so forth. So I thought, well, he, he, must, be, he must be a decent guy. And I, and I reached out to him. Uh, I think it was December of last year, and uh, he said, yeah, we'd be interested, and, and uh, I'm uh, going to, uh, uh, that, that'd be great. Well, you know, of course, that was right around the time we were going to Thailand, so, so it, there, there were some things going on in their church at the time that he thought wouldn't be too bad. Well, when I got back from Thailand, um, he said, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to help you as much as I had planned and so forth, and I remember that day when I, when I found that out, I told my wife, this is done. It's over. It's come done. Two hours later, I don't know if it was even that long, I started going on the internet <laughs> looking for Airbnbs. I'm like, no, this is not done. And I found a place that I knew that we could at least house 12 people. So I'm like, okay, we're just going to keep moving forward. I know this church won't be able to do what we thought they could do, but let's just go there. And that was about the February last year, and that's when I really opened it up, of course. And then all of a sudden, we had people started filling in this trip, you know, we, it was a short time frame. It was $2,500, one of the more expensive trips we've done up to this point. But one by one, people started getting on board with it. In fact, four people from the Bangkok Blitz got on. You know, they had just been there, been on the field, but yet they, they, they signed up. And, and, uh, and slowly but surely, the team went from 12 to 13 to 20. And it was, it was incredible to see God build that together. Then one of the biggest challenges was literature. You know, where, how were we going to get all the tracks that we would need? Well, years ago, maybe you remember Tom Godet, um, good friend of mine, mentor, really the one that kind of ins has inspired this ministry, one of the, one of the key men at least. And um, he, had, he had a... A relationship with Chick Publications, if you know what they are, they're those cartoon tracks. That, uh, anyways, he had helped us get tracks for some of the other projects we did, like the Asian Games and the and the Youth Olympics and things like that. But, but Tom passed away, and we were always planning to go to Chick to meet up with those people, but he was not physically able to, since he had gotten off the field. And, of course, he passed away at the end of 2022. So I, I, I didn't have a connection, but I reached out. I, I looked up some things on their website, and I reached out to them. And, and uh, I got a call from the, the, a lady there, and she, or I think I, maybe I called them. And the lady responded and said, yeah, we, we do help missions, projects, and things like that. And my husband is the one that that kind of helps facilitate some of this. And here's his email address. You can email him and so forth. And the, so I sent an email and I, I told him about Tom and the guy replied back, oh yeah, I remember Tom. He was a real mover and shaker for the Lord. We, and uh, isn't that interesting? I, the person I was looking for, I found. And they said, I think we can get behind that, what you're going to do. And we just have to reach out to some of our supporters and they evidently have many. And they came up and they were able to give us, I, I believe it ended up being 45,000 tracks, shipped free of charge, printed free of charge for us over to France. The pastor over there that received the tracks told me that, that, that on the bill of lading that they had, that it was worth $5,000. So, and as I, as I mentioned too, the, God began to fill key people who filled in gaps and enjoyed and, and joined and assisted the team. The French church um, that we were with, or at least they su helped support us, um, at the time when we initially contacted or, you know, through some of the process there, they were having some issues within the church. They had, they had some people leave, things like that. Churches go through things, unfortunately, with that. But they were doing better, and uh, they were able to supply meals to us which that's a big expense and a big burden. And boy, they gave us a lot of food. <laughs> and um, 
in the process of that, I, I learned of another missionary there that had only been there a couple of years. And he was like, I'm helping different groups, and I'm, well, whatever I can do to be a help to you guys. And he helped out, uh, at least initially, uh, to get us there. And then uh, another good aspect was we had a pastor and his family come. Uh, Brother Jonathan Perks, he was here a couple of years ago. Uh, he's got a family, five kids, and his wife. And, and uh, they, they, uh, their house ended up being our headquarters where we had our meetings and stored our tracks. And, and his wife was very helpful with uh, the meals. And just he was helpful as being a kind of a right-hand man for me while I was over there. And I told him, I was like, you, your family really filled in gaps for us while we were over there. And the results spoke for themselves. Over 25,000 tracks out, 108 countries reached. And I just sat back the last day. I'm just thinking to myself, I remember the bumps and the twists and the turns through this whole process. And now I'm looking at the end of it. And I'm like, only God could have done that. Only God could have done that. And it's, it's just amazing to sit back now and like all the things you get stressed over, all the concerns, all the unknowns. But God did it all. And, uh, we, and, and it, really, it really spoke to me about what God can do when the people just give them an opportunity and step out by faith. You know, I, what amazes me through the whole process, again, is watching God do what I could not have done on, on my own. It was encouraging to me, to me to see details, big and small, get worked out. And as I said, the trip was different than others. Again, usually I have a dedicated missionary or a national pastor who has helped facilitate things on the other side. In this case, that was limited, and that placed a lot of extra burden on me. It did. It, it challenged me, it pushed me, and it gave me a greater understanding of what needs to happen on these types of things. To, and I had to figure out more in a shorter time frame, and many times I wasn't quite sure how the issue or what or that uh, how this issue or that issue would be addressed, yet the Lord would continually work things out. Open doors or provided personnel resources that, as I mentioned, filled in gaps. It reminded me that God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply, as the famous missionary Hudson Taylor once stated. Now, I've had the privilege of knowing some great missionaries in the past who could testify of God's working in advancing the gospel in foreign lands I'm thankful that our group had the opportunity to experience these types of things as well, both in Thailand and now here in Paris. You know, Project World, we've, all, we've kind of been doing it for years, but it kind of, after COVID, you know, kind of that ministry kind of rebirthed itself and it became more, more organized, more, more focused, more driven because it was birthed out of his desire to give people a first-hand experience on the mission field as to enlarge their vision for what God is doing around the planet. My prayer has always been that people would have their heart affected by what they saw and they experienced to the point that they are never the same again. That they are changed from the inside out. That they would be people who will devote more of their life to Jesus Christ than they had before. My prayer has also been that God would make himself more real to people. I think that is the greatest need in our hour is for God to be real to God's people. Because if he isn't real to them, he will not be real to those people out there. He has got to be real in your heart and life. You've got to be able to testify with confidence that you've got something that the world doesn't have. And it's more than a religion. It's the greatest relationship that they could have. And, that's, and being involved in these types of things allows people, as they experience answered prayers and unique opportunities they may not have otherwise had stateside. You know, I, I think of that that prayer answered by Kristen Nadaski from Lehigh Valley, asking for Malawi when there was really no hope of seeing a Malawi person reached. <laughs> uh, yet, comes rocking across their path. Again, that's just pure luck, right? No. That's God. 
You know, as I've testified many times in the past, that's what once happened to me years ago. And my prayer is that God will use this ministry to impact the lives of many who dare to step outside the borders of their comfort zone and go to the foreign field to serve. You may never be called to be a missionary, but I tell you something, it, it enlarges your heart for missions itself. I know how it impacts people. I know how it impacts their involvement, their giving, their prayers, everything. And that's why it's so significant and important, I believe. With that said, our next endeavor is the Zambia Outreach Project. I'm excited to go back to Africa. It's been many years. I've never been to Zambia. But I thank God there's a good missionary, a good man there. And there's a church that's been well established. And I know they want to start more churches. They want to do more. And we're still working out the details of what will take place there. But, of course, it's September of next year. And, and there has been... I've had a fair amount of people already saying, hey, let me know when the registration's open. I've, uh, and uh, I'm praying that we'll get the 25 slots filled uh, before long. But I'll be opening, as I mentioned already, I'll be opening up the registration in the next few weeks. I have to do some tweaking to the documents I send out to prospective team members so they know exactly what to expect and what's expected of them when they're there. But the vision for this ministry is to continue to pursue opportunities around the globe, similarly to the places and the events that we've done in the past. My first and number one target with this is always these sporting events because they are a mass conglomeration or they, they a mass uh, collection, I should say, of nations usually from various places, whether they're continents or the world in the case here of Paris. But that's not always possible, so there will be things like Zambia or Mongolia, like we had a few years ago, that we will pursue as the Lord will direct us. And another aspect, I'm just going to put this as a teaser out there for you, but we also are considering doing some tours. So that will feel a little more like a vacation for some of you. But that will be really there to enhance the spiritual understanding of God's people in places of spiritual significance. We've done some in Israel, and there's consideration of some other places to be continued. Amen. <laughs> Anyways, tonight I hope that your heart was encouraged and enlarged in some capacity for God. And I want to just conclude tonight, again, with a big thank you to those of you back home. Not everybody can go on every trip. I get that. I would love to take all of you, but you know, that's not even possible. And I thank you for every person that, that was here faithful during the services, encouraging the preachers that come in here and some of the guys who fill in for me. They need your encouragement. You know, they need you to be here. And I appreciate, you know, some of them are, are working jobs and then having to go and study, and that's not an easy thing to do, have to do. So thank you for being faithful to hear those people who are trying to feed you. And, and, and those that, that, that took care of business, you know, things happen around here. <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, that, that, that means a lot. I, I'm glad to hear when, I mean, I know I keep up with what goes on back here. And I'm grateful for people staying by the stuff. Because things have to continue. And, uh, and that allows us to do our job over there. And, and, and to do your job over here. It makes a big difference. So never think that just because we talk about this stuff, that, that your role isn't important too. It is. It really is. Not everyone can go out. But I do want to encourage you, if you've never gone out before, really prayerfully consider it at some point here. Lord willing, we will have opportunities coming up in the, in the upcoming years, and that's the plan. You know, I can't control everything that happens, like it happened with COVID. But if the Lord, along the Lord, as long as the Lord allows us to do things, we will continue to do that by the grace of God. Because it's our passion, really, to inspire everybody, both in this church and some of our partnering churches, to really be involved in getting the gospel to the world. And I pray that God will use Project World in that capacity. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Again, I said this was going to be a little different service.
but I think it was a sweet service. And I appreciate the testimonies that were given. I think they were very heartfelt. And uh, that's what, and that's what we want, is what God did in your heart while you were there. All right. With that said, Wednesday night we'll be back here, back uh, at it again. I encourage you to be faithful in God's house and uh, looking forward to uh, pressing forward with the prayer revival and all the other things coming up. So let's go ahead and tonight, I'm just going to close with a word of prayer and then we will be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for your love and graciousness to us. Thank you for working in our hearts and lives. Thank you for what you're doing through our church, Lord God. It's a blessing to be involved in, in all the different aspects. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would really speak to our lives and our hearts and help us to get a greater vision of you and our part in fulfilling your plan here in this world. Lord, we worship you tonight. You mean the world to us. And Lord, we want the world to know how good you are in your plan of salvation. God, may we be able to touch lives this week. May you open doors to be a witness in some capacity to somebody. May we see this place filled with seekers. May we be seekers ourselves. We worship you now and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. God bless you. Lord willing, see you Wednesday night.